Hi Titans, today on In Focus, we have Craig M. Lofton, PhD lecturer in the American Studies Department at Cal State Fullerton, author of Masked Voices, Gay Men and Lesbians in Cold War America. He is also the editor of Letters to One, Gay and Lesbian Voices from the 1950s and 1960s. After earning his PhD at USC in history in 2006, Professor Lofton began teaching here at Cal State Fullerton. Hi, Professor Lofton. Thanks so much for being here with us at In Focus. We're really excited to talk to you. But for some of our viewers who may not be familiar with you, can you give us a little bit of background of where you grew up and who you are and why you ended up going to USC? Okay. Um, well, I teach in the American Studies Department, and um, I, I grew up in the Bay Area. I, uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara, where I was a history sociology double major. So I was very into history, but kind of from a more social angle. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's weird. I finished college, and I felt like I, I, there was so much more to learn. And I felt like I'd barely skimmed the surface. So I thought, well, grad school will give me something to do while I figure out the next step. And uh, I just kept getting deeper into it, you know. I got an MA at the University of Oregon. And um, then that led me to the PhD program at USC. And the main, two things brought me there. Um, one thing that brought me there is their history department is very good on things that I was interested in, um, as far as like the 20th century American history and film. I um, was anticipating doing a project that had to do with film at the time and the Hollywood blacklist and things like that. And so USC was one of the best places to do that. Also, there's a lot of historical archives around LA, so I just wanted to be in LA as a grad student. Why history, though? Was this something that you knew early on that you wanted to pursue? I think, I don't know. You know, I've been interested in history since I was a little kid. And I, I used to bug my dad about the past, and, and, you know, he would know a little, but not as much. And so I was just always obsessed with what happened here before? What, what happened here? What happened here before? And I'll tell you something else, you know, when I was a kid, I watched a lot of TV. I was, I was a real TV junkie, you know, and just, just glued in front of the TV for, for hours and hours and hours. And I watched a lot of old TV. I was fascinated yeah. by like old, you know, I mean, I watched Bugs Bunny cartoons, but they were from the 40s, you know, and I was yeah. aware that they were old. And I used to be into like really, into like Abbott and Costello movies that were from the 40s, you know, and yeah. the Little Rascals, you know, stuff that used to be on reruns, but was old. And there was something about the idea of like that you could look into the past and literally see it, you know, that, that just from a young age just kind of hypnotized me. And, and I think I've always seen TV and media, film generally is kind of like almost a time travel device, like a window, oh, you know, where we can we can leave our ugly 2021 <laughs> and go back to yeah. some reassuring past where we know what happens, you know. And I think my whole life I've I've had that that just feeling of of uh, oh, if I could go back, I would, but I can't. So I'll I'll watch I'll movies watch and movies. read every book I can to try to reconstruct yeah. it in my mind. Well. You teach in the American Studies Department. I'm in your American Dream class, which I am, I'm, I'm loving it so much. But what other classes do you teach within this department? Well, I've taught, uh, it's a class called Intro to American Studies, which just kind of lays out the, you know, basic idea of the, the discipline. I, I used to teach a lot, a class called Intro to Pop Culture, um, which where we kind of look at a lot of historical issues in pop culture. And uh, we talk about, you know, blackface minstrelsy and mm -hmm. movie stereotypes and, you know, some of the things that are in, in this other class, but, but other examples, you know, so they don't overlap. Um, I've also taught a class called California Cultures that really gets into kind of California as its own unique uh, historical entity and oh, identity. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, let me say that next semester I'm teaching a class called American Studies 473, uh, Sexual Orientations and American Culture. And, and I've taught that several times in the past, and I'm very excited to be teaching it again. We will just be looking at LGBTQ issues, both historically and the present, theoretically. Uh, we're going to read a bunch of books and talk a lot, just a lot of sitting around and trying to make sense of, of uh, fluid, difficult, complicated issues that, that are very relevant for people's lives. I love that you're teaching that class. I won't be here. I, w I really <laughs> wish I was here for it. 
Um, and I think it's so important to have a class like that. I don't. I'm, there's not enough there's on this no, campus. No, and well, and, and many other campuses too. I don't think people have right. access to that I, kind of content. I'm not. I don't even know if the history department has a has like a gay history class, which is you know it's a huge history department, and, and I've, I, maybe they do now. I know they didn't in the past. You know, so it's a it's a it's a it's a subject of history that is very. Um, it's not taught at the lower levels and at, like you're saying, at the college levels, you sort of have to almost go out of your way to find it. So I, I've always made sure in every class I teach to make sure there is at least one or two weeks of LGBT content. So that no matter what class you're taking with me, you get just a little bit of mm -hmm. understanding that there is a history there, that, that you've probably never heard of it, and that once you, you just start looking at it, it's, it's so fascinating and interesting. And I found that whenever I teach this stuff, students just come alive and pay way more attention and take more notes and, and put it in the tests in much more detail. I can attest to that because being in your class, when you do touch on the gay and lesbian history, I do perk up and I'm, I'm heterosexual, but it's fascinating because it makes, it opens my eyes to what this community has been going through that we are just not, people, who, heterosexuals are not aware of, but then gay and lesbian and anyone in the LGBTQ community is looking at this and they're saying, okay, well somebody, somebody's speaking for us. And I, I, I can tell you, we have students in our class that may be closeted and you are giving them that hope and someone's speaking for them and, and opening their eyes, but opening the eyes of people who, don't know the history, and I think it's so important for you to do that. And I, so I appreciate you bringing the sexual orientation class to the campus because I know we have a lot of students here that may not be ready to come out, and you might be giving them that opportunity. I, I think the history gives you a very solid foundation uh, yes. for self understanding and to know just you know. Because the thing for me was I grew up believing that being gay was was a horrible, terrible, awful thing. I mean, growing up in the 80s, you internalize from a very young age that this is the worst thing possible. It's like an affliction that you're struck with, you know? And you just expect to get bullied if, if you reveal any part of that yourself. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of all taken for granted. But, but when, I, when I really started reading LGBT, and this wasn't until grad school, you know, this wasn't until I was in my 20s, yeah. you know, well into my 20s. I actually, that was the first encounter I had with some of the stuff I've taught, like about the early gay rights movement, you know, or even even Harvey Milk, you know, yeah. um, just stuff like that was was just I was prevented from learning about that. And when I realized, you know, when I when I started seeing all that and reading some of the really amazing research that has come out in the last several decades, I realized that this is something that's it's really awesome to be a part of that. Like I felt like, oh my God, this is something that I really feel honored, I'm like honored to be gay, you know, as opposed to ashamed. Like my whole perspective flipped oh 180 degrees just knowing that, that there was a history here, you know, and that yeah. I was a part of that history and that it's, it's in every country, it's been going on forever. The words change, the concepts change, you know, the, the cultural attitudes are, are, you know, vary, you know, from wherever you are. But it's been one of the most fundamental dimensions of human history from the earliest recorded time. Yeah, that's true. Well, then let's talk about your book because in, in the Masked Voices book, Gay and Lesbians in the Cold War, it talks about, it, it, well, it highlights the letters to the magazine that otherwise would not have ever been dis discovered unless you did this dissertation. Can you just give us a little bit of history about how this happened and, and why this is so important to highlight these letters. Well, you know, the gay rights movement, uh, the first formal organizations were in the early 1950s. A lot of people think it was Stonewall in the, in the late 60s, but really in LA, there were activists starting to form organizations and try out different strategies. And it was still illegal to be gay then, so you had, they had to be very low key mm -hmm. and careful how they went about their yeah. activism. They thought the hammer might fall down at any moment, and, and the hammer got close a few times, but they were very shrewd and adaptive. Yeah. to what they were trying to do. So um, 
the, the, there was uh, the, this magazine you're referring to was called One Magazine, and it was the byproduct of this, what was the second gay rights organization in the country. They called themselves One Incorporated, and, and they just had this simple idea, let's, let's get a magazine out there, and it's not an erotic magazine, or had, didn't have any sexual content, just, just a discussion about being gay in American society. And they believed they had a free speech right to, to publish that. Eventually, the Supreme Court uh, up, upheld that right, you know, yes. um, in 1958, that, that a, a gay magazine in and of itself doesn't violate obscenity standards. <laughs> um, and, and so the magazine was important. Um, and I started doing a dissertation project with it when in the archive I encountered the actual, the letters that people wrote to the magazine. And the letters were far more interesting than the magazine. The magazine's <laughs> fine, it's interesting, but you kind of get it after yeah. a while. You know, it, it's the same people writing the stories and it repeats itself and they have a kind of, uh, not an ideology, but a certain worldview that, that they're expressing, you know. But the letters were from all over the place and expressed all sorts of other voices. And these were voices that have never really heard, you know, been heard outside of this context before. And these people told their stories, and they went into a lot of detail. For a lot of them, this magazine was maybe the only other gay people they knew. You know, they, might, they might be 3,000 yeah. miles away, and, and they're writing a letter, Dear One, and uh, they're, they're saying, you know, you're, you're the only people I know on the planet that I can say these things to. Let me get a few things off my chest. And then, they, and then I'm reading it, you know, decades later, going, wow, this is like there's so much detail and insight about how they see themselves, about how they think about themselves. Um, most of the research that focuses on gay people in the 1950s focuses on the oppressions that they suffered. It focuses on the fact that they were arrested uh, in huge numbers, kicked out of government jobs, uh, pathologized as mentally ill. There's a lot of research on that, and it's a very gloomy narrative, yes. you know, it's just victim, 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 and, and suffering and suffering and suffering. And I felt that putting these voices, these letters out there was very important because this offered a different perspective on all of that, which is that gay people weren't so much victims in the 50s as adapters and survivors. And, and they, they, a lot of them knew how to kind of get around the repressions that are there and, and to have agency to you know, be strategically gay when they could get away with it and then pass as straight when they had to. And um, what I found is that there was a lot more resiliency, a lot more creativity, mm -hmm. a lot more inner strength in gay people in the face of these oppressions than anyone has ever really acknowledged. And so the letters gave me an insight that, that people were already angry and wanting to do something in the 50s. They weren't just sitting around, uh, you know, you know as, as victims all getting lobotomies or mental health torture, things like that. They were, some of them were starting to think, how do we improve our status and uh, at individuals and at a collective level? That's interesting to hear that perspective because you're right. We, we always hear the ridicule and the oppression. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the, uh, the masks and, you, and it's the title of your book, The Masked Voices. So are you saying that the gays and lesbians in that era, it wasn't that they were trying to hide or closet themselves, but they wore a mask in order to, I guess, adapt to certain situations that may not have been as accepted as other situations. Yeah, I mean, it can be kind of a fine point, but, but in, I felt it was a very important one and one I wanted to make in, in my research, which is that there's a tendency, it started in the 1970s. Starting in the 70s, people would look back at the 50s and say, oh, back then they were all closeted. In the 70s was when people started coming out in large scale when the modern coming out narrative kind of really kicked in. And once that started, people looked at the past and sort of uh, you know, projected the concept of the closet back onto people in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so that's to this day, you know, people talk about gay stuff in the 50s, they go, everyone was closeted back then, and there's just kind of assumption of that. And um, I, I never found that term or that concept or that word in any of the sources I looked at. What I kept finding was the mask. Yeah. That, that they saw themselves as people who wore masks, not as people dwelling in some closet. So, yeah, they were hiding, but not 
cowering in a dark place, waiting the, for the hammer to fall. In the sense fall. of a closet as we right. perceive it. A mask means you're out in the world. Masks have an interesting history. Think about like Mardi Gras or something, yes. the way people yes. wear masks as a kind of way of inverting the rules a little bit and of maybe getting away with things you know, uh, officially, but, but uh, when a gay person wears a mask, that means they're getting away with it, you know? Yes. That the society <laughs> isn't oppressing them, and at some level, they can live a life as a gay person. Now, it was much harder to live that life back then for a number of reasons, but people were more resilient in their ability to, to find partners and um, to, to, to have meaningful lives as gay men and lesbians than we often assume that they did. So going into your book, The Masked Voices, what letter stood out to you the most? What is the most memorable letter to you that maybe impacted you the most? There's so many, it's really hard to pick. Let me say this, when I, when I first kind of discovered the letters in the archive, and they didn't know they had the letters at the archive, they had just been relocated from, uh, the, one of the old activists from the magazine had just died. And he'd kind of run the magazine with an iron fist. And when he and, and when the magazine ended in the 60s, he took all the letters that people had written and he hid them in his closet. And he hid them there for, for future historical purposes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, for, <laughs> for, for Professor me, Lofton for me, to open later, up, yes. basically. <laughs> um, but anyway, he had just died and those had just been put in the, the, the archive you know, like months before yes. I arrived to begin my project. And wow. it was a really good uh, matter of, of timing. Um, but one of the first letters that I pulled out, once I realized what they were, I was, I was gasping with, with like astonishment, you know. But one of the very first ones I pulled out was written from, uh, it was written in the early 60s. And it was, the date on it was, was my birthday. Not, oh not the day gosh. I was born, but my birthday day. Yes. You know, I was born in the 70s, but this was like 10 years <laughs> earlier, like, like June 23rd, like, oh my God, he wrote this. It, just seeing that, that date. And the first line was, hello, I'm 21 years old and I'm writing to you from the Norman Beatty Psychiatric Institution. Aww. I've been here for two years. I don't know how to, I'm, I'm being, you know, it's a letter from a mental institution. That is, yeah, From someone powerful. who's 21 powerful. and with, with mm -hmm. just kind of a weird connection to my birthday. And it's in his own handwriting. That's the thing. It's written in this kind of, the, the, you know, the handwriting reveals things about the personalities of the people who, who wrote them. I mean, without even getting into a formal analysis, you just, you feel something about who these people are just in the way they squiggled the, 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 the words on the, the paper. And this was a pretty yes. long letter. It went on for several pages. Yeah. And it was one of the first ones I read. And what was amazing about it was here was this guy who was kind of the, the ultimate gay 50 stereotype. He's locked up in a mental institution, you know, trying to get cured of something that he can't. But he had this kind of resilient attitude that surprised me. Like, he, he, the way he was, he didn't sound like a depressed Victim, he sounded like someone who was ready to assert his rights and ready to say, listen, well, this, is, let's, this has got to stop. We, we, we need to do something, all of us, you know? And there was this oh, kind wow. of feeling like, I want to do, you know, I, I need help now, but, but this, is, this is bigger than just me, you know? And so that, that set the tone, you know? And uh, so many other letters just, just hit me in so many other different ways. Well, let's talk about your own personal experience as a gay man growing up in America. And you came out in your mid mid, mid 20s. 20s. Yeah. And why did it take you until your 20s to come out? And and also, was your family supportive? What was the family dynamic like for you? Well, I I, I was born in the early 70s, so I I hit adolescence at the peak of the AIDS crisis. Yeah. I mean, I hit adolescence literally at the worst worst moment of the AIDS crisis. Um, even before there was really much testing or anything, when the homophobia and the bigotry, when the AIDS jokes were at their peaks, um, when, you know, Reagan still hadn't said the word AIDS publicly yet, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when there was a genuine perception among many gay men that there was a genocide happening. Um, I'm not saying there was, but a lot of people of felt that, that, mm -hmm. that they were being left to die on purpose because they were gay. Um, I grew up in a, I guess you could call it a, a very Reagan Republican household. Um, not religious, 
but but my dad, Reagan, was the guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, alongside Reagan were all those religious right moral majority people and those were the ones saying that AIDS is God's punishment you know and that gay people deserve AIDS because because of what they do and so I aligned that with the politics I was growing up with and just assumed well that's 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 the correct worldview you know yeah and so I internalized that you know at a at, you know at, at a moment when you know it could do the most damage to me and I and and I think at a broader level you know Certainly as the 80s unfolded, and um, I, I couldn't, there was no way at that time for me to, to imagine myself as, as a successful person, as someone who would eventually go on and be a successful person with a career and a job and, wow. and just, mm -hmm. and be gay at the same time. It, it seemed like it was one or the other. Wow. And so I was 13 years old, and, and all you heard about, all I heard about gay people was how they were dying and how a lot of them deserved to die. And I, I you know, you already kind of know deep down, you know, but I remember sort of consciously saying to myself, well, if I'm gay, I'm going to die. So I'm not, I, I can't be gay. Oh my gosh. And it was just kind of this, this mm -hmm. logic that I locked into and I clung to it for a long time. Um, when I went to college in the early nineties, it was still very dicey being out. There was no one out on my dorm floor. There was no one out in my entire eight-story dormitory as far as I knew. Oh my gosh. You know, I mean, you're talking about maybe, you know, a campus of 30,000 students and you have an LGBTQ meeting and maybe it's five people who, sh you know, for the whole campus. Yes. And um, th this, this, you know, the, the, the fear of AIDS and, of, and homophobia was still very strong during that whole college year. So I, I clung to my denial. It wasn't so much being closeted, it was, it was deep denial. It was just like, denial. no, this isn't possible for me. This can't be wow. me, this isn't possible. And it took a long time to unravel that. It took a long time and many, uh, I think, broader historical forces. Um, you know, and as the 90s went on, things started improving. Um, they, the, as far as AIDS went, they came up with drugs that could keep people alive. And then when Ellen DeGeneres came out, it, that was a big deal. And that was a real mm -hmm. historic event because yes. she was the first person who was really at the top of her game, a major celebrity, to do it while she's at the top of her game, while she had her show, on her show. You know, that, that, that had never happened before. That shifted so much. Um, I will tell you, um, in the early 90s on MTV, the original Real World, season three, was a was another landmark kind of thing for people my generation. That was one of the first things that taught us that gay people aren't the horrible, disgusting people we learned them to be. Um, this, was, this is something that's interesting to look into. The season three of The Real World, it was set in San Francisco. And they had a, a one of the household members was a, uh, he was this, he was Cuban American, HIV positive and openly gay. You know, wow. and, and this is back when the real world was real. It yeah. was just people living <laughs> yes. their lives yeah. and it wasn't all contrived and stupid. And so it was just people living together. And, and you know, at first there, there, it was interesting to hear all the other roommates kind of work through their anxieties about that, but kind of come to a place where they accepted him. But there was one guy in the household who, who, who refused and he, he sort of dug into his homophobia. And there was a point where everyone in the house had to choose. Who do we want, you know? Pedro, you know, HIV positive Pedro or, or <laughs> this guy over here. And they kicked out the other guy. And, and, and in the 80s, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. You know, in yeah. the 80s, the whole thing would have gone the other way. Would, the burden on the gay guy to leave, you know. But, but that, so that was, was like, huge. That, that was, was huge. huge. And moment. me and my roommates were locked. We, it was like a soap opera. We were too numb. <laughs> and then the thing was, you know, they film it and then they show it like six months later. Yeah. While they were showing those episodes, Pedro Zamora was dying. Oh. And, and, and that was in the newspapers. So we were watching this struggle over whether he had a right to live at the moment he was dying of the disease at oh age 22 gosh. or 23 or something. He was profound. A, and he was a beautiful human being. Yes. And that, that, you know, a lot of those things happened in the 90s. And um, eventually, again, the history was the, the thing that unraveled it. You know, when I started reading about gay history and LGBT history and how amazing and fascinating it was, um, that was when I said, okay, it's, it's me too, <laughs> to, to borrow a, a slogan from the present, you know, <laughs> it's a whole different use of it. But 
I realized, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome, like it was a whole flip. So speaking of, on homophobia and, um, and the 80s and AIDS, have we made any progress? We're in 2021, have we truly made any progress in the gay community? Yes, we've made progress. The, the, the bar has changed, the expectations are changed, the laws have changed, you know, that there has been absolute, genuine, real progress. There is still homophobia, yes. there are still problems. <laughs> there are still a lot of the same old things lingering on that were there before. And um, there's still, you know, all those problems. But people, I mean, my college students that I've had ever since I've been teaching here, you know, for 15 years, and actually going back to grad school at USC also, you know, um, have a fundamentally different reaction to how I talk about these things compared to how it was in the 80s. Yes, you know? yes. And, and I think what's happened is that the homophobia that is still there, you know, it kind of went underground. It, it, it couldn't, it wasn't as openly expressed as it had been before, you know? And um, I think the last several years, uh, the political climate in this country has brought some of that yes. back up to the mm -hmm. surface, along with along a lot with of the racial racism and everything and else. So yes. it was kind of just hidden, and, but it never was gone for some people. It was just hidden and now, Given the the presidential administration, yeah. it's kind of been able to show its yeah. face again. Everyone struggles in different ways, but let me give you a tangible example of progress. Okay. Okay. When I was going to school, there there weren't no gay straight clubs in high schools, <laughs> much less middle schools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now they have gay straight clubs in middle schools. That would have been which is huge, unimaginable, yeah. unimaginable in the 1980s, and the fact that. The fact that those can meet and that the students don't get beat up every time they have a meeting, that's a sign of progress. Yeah, absolutely. It may sound sad that that's just it the is, bar, but, but that, is, yeah. that is a very big thing. And just look at how many openly gay celebrities there are in all walks of life, you know? I mean, I turn on the so news. Many. I turn so on the many. news. Yes. I have my choice of gay anchors <laughs> now, you know. <laughs> and it's wonderful, Anderson Cooper coming out on right. CNN, and I had suspicions that he was gay, and I and I would say, well, I mean, come on, Anderson, come out because you're going to do so much for the community. Just come out, come on, yeah, you know. And and then he finally did, and I think it's wonderful. And Don Lemon as yeah, well, and exactly. watching them, and just just to have them as role models. Yes, just to know that people younger now can grow up and, and that it's not an issue that that exists, you know? But I think on a, on a, on a, if, if we broaden the scale a little bit, I feel when, when someone like Anderson Cooper or Don Lemon come out and they're journalists, and those are journalists I've looked up to for a while, it, and I'm not gay, but when they came out, it gave me the ability to look at other things that I'm dealing with inside of my life that I was not facing, men and, and I'm speaking on mental illness. You know, mm -hmm, I struggle mm -hmm. with severe anxiety mm -hmm. and OCD, and that's something that I had to address. But when, when seeing someone come out and face something that can be so scary and has been so mm -hmm. scary for so many years, I think it it's a beacon for us, and maybe not just in the gay community, but in other areas of life that show, you know, that took a lot of courage to do that. Yeah, I mean, if you look at American history, there's so many interesting shared patterns and similarities in terms of how different minority groups both have been treated and also how they've responded yes. to their various yes. treatments. And, and, you know, this is something I think about sometimes when I teach, you know. I, I often teach, as you know, from other backgrounds, you know, yes. like what's it, what, what does this look like to a black American? What does this look like to a woman? What does this look like to, you know, a Chicano activist? You know, I try to get yes, in all these different shoes. I appreciate you, you know, just educating us and educating me as a straight woman and, but touching on how women were in the 50s and which was horrible and I'm so <laughs> glad I wasn't born and raised in the 50s. Um, but I appreciate you teaching this history because it's so important. And right now we are seeing a lot of conflict within the trans community because, you know, the gay and lesbian community kind of came out first. And I feel like the transgender community is something that's still just very um, unexplored for a lot of people. Historically, they don't really know much about it. So I would like to talk to you about the transgender community. And a lot of people out there, a lot of conservatives are, you know, they'll say really horrible things like, it's a choice and tra being transgender is not real and they don't believe that if a, a woman is born as a man sexually that they could really identify as a woman inside. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? 
you're right that there is conflict in the trans community, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue to you that the fact that this conflict is happening is actually a sign of significant progress in terms yes. of the trans community having more visibility and having more of a voice than it has ever had before. Um, I think, you know, when the gay lesbian movement started way back when it was the gay lesbian movement, the assumption... The assumption was, yes, trans, bisexual people, they're a part of this, but they're not really us. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, at first the idea was, was trans people were just kind of included, but, but their needs, you know, the gay men and lesbians were kind of getting most of the attention, basically. And people who identified as trans were insisting that it's not the same. We, there's a historical connection, obviously. We've all hung out together for eons, but... But that doesn't mean that the needs of a gay man are the same as a trans man, you know. Um, I think what, what is important to know here is that the word transgender did not even really exist until like the 90s. I think it might have been coined in the 80s, but didn't come to any kind of yeah. widespread usage yes. throughout. And so that, that word transgender and just the fact that it has become such a dominant term within the last 20 years is a signal and indication that um, of, of people who used to call themselves transvestites, hermaphrodites, transsexuals, yes. all these kind of different uh, you know, versions of what we know, they now use the same word to describe themselves. And that indicates that they're seeing themselves all as part of the same movement, yet one that is also somewhat distinct from the gay lesbian movement because they've realized they can't depend on us to fight for their rights either. Yes. Now let me say this, um, when in the early 70s, when gay men and lesbians had their first big breakthrough, and I would say had the same level of visibility that trans people have now, guess what they did for the rest of the decade? They fought each other. They fought each other because they, they they all had their agendas, they all had their ideas, they all had their different experiences, <laughs> but now they were visible, they were a real minority, there was money coming in, yes, you know, from, yeah. from their organizations, and they all fought about it, you know? Um, I mean, in, in LA, they, they started the very first gay community resources center, you know? But, but the lesbians boycotted it because it didn't have, because they didn't it, feel represented it in didn't it. Include so they were, them. they were actually picketing it on the first day <laughs> just to know that this is not a new thing. Yes. And it's actually a sign of progress, these, these arguments, because it means that, that the conversations are actually happening yes, now. Yes, that's true. Um, and I think when you get to trans um, you know, identities, you, there, there are so many kind of unique expressions, you know, and, and I think we, we have a tendency to put things in boxes. And the struggle is to understand things more as a continuum and, and, a, and a sort of fluid continuum in terms of polarities and, and how we think about these things. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think everyone is just kind of figuring this out right now, you know? Yeah. So trans people have the spotlight on them in a way that, that historically is, is very unique. And, and, and the, the, the conflicts they're having within their community are part of that growing pain. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, but I mean, just look at the tangible, I mean, you can be trans now and walk down the street. You, you still have to worry about violence. Trans people still get murdered on a, on a regular basis. But the fact that we as a society now see that as a problem. Yeah. And talk about it as something that should end. That's actually what's new. So looking at, I think a lot of us would like to hear your perspective on the walkout at Netflix that happened about three weeks ago. It was uh, started by Ashley Marie Preston. She's a, a transgender female activist in the transgender community. And she sparked it where these uh, employees walked out on Netflix because Netflix is still airing and hosting Dave Chappelle's comedy series. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I watched it through, you know, through its entirety. And mm -hmm. he does touch on the transgender uh, community. He makes a lot of really, you know, bad jokes. But I mean, and, and they're, he does that to the white community, even the black community. So my question to you is, do the transgender people in the trans community have a point? Is this harmful in the comedy field or do comedians get a pass? <sighs> it's, a, it's a hard issue because I think transgender people for so long have been looked at by society as either a freak or yeah. a joke. And the most common punchline you can have in American pop culture, 
and pick any decade in the 20th century is, oh, a man wearing a dress. Right. Or a woman yes. dressed like a, that's mm -hmm. the punchline for yeah. anything. Yes. You're talking about, and these are people who struggle with their identities, you know, and, and suffer alone, and, and it has always been seen just as a joke. Um, I, I think when you go picking on groups in comedy, I think the good comedians, the smart comedians, um, have an awareness of where the power has been yes. and, and how to kind of avoid reinforcing the, the harmful, degrading stereotypes of the past. Now, any trans person will tell you, as I think any woman will tell you, that there's a relationship between that media image of being a joke or a freak and the real life violence that they suffer and have to think about every time that they yes. go out of their houses. Mm -hmm. And, and so for them, there's a direct line between the mockery and ridicule of them that's been going on and their own basic safety. Whereas I think other groups, it, it, you can jo the joking doesn't quite have that degree of sensitivity to it. Um, in the early 80s, Eddie Murphy made a lot of AIDS jokes. Yes. In fact, those were some of the things that made him most popular at the time. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, he apologized. I think quite sincerely for the AIDS jokes. He never apologized to gay people though for the harm he did on yeah. stereotyping yeah. and the damage that that did, but he did eventually wake up to the fact that this was wrong and it took him a while. He was a hot comedian yes, and uh, yeah, he, yeah. he heard people laughing tell an AIDS joke and people laugh. Well, he's a comedian, you know, isn't he supposed to feed yeah. that? Well, yeah, if you think people dying of AIDS is funny, people did in the early 80s and he fueled, he poured gasoline on that. Yeah. And that was very, that was traumatic for me. I mean, I was listening to it, I was laughing as a form of denial of my own sexuality. Interesting. I was thinking if I laugh at Eddie Murphy, <laughs> you know, talking about faggots, you know, yeah. and, and throwing that yeah. word around liberally, I mean, that's on that. If you get Eddie Murphy's first two stand up albums, that's what the routines are called faggots. And then on the second one, it's called Faggots Revisited. That's what it's literally said, you know? That's um, brutal. <laughs> I mean, that's right there. And then it's like every other word, you know? I know that that damaged me. And so I, 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 I you know, I, I'm not going to see an Eddie Murphy movie ever yeah. in my life again, even though I do think he's funny sometimes, you know, and, and enjoyed <laughs> him in the past. I'm, I'm not going near that guy because yes, of that. Yeah. And now with Chappelle, I, I don't know what's going to happen or where this is going to go. He's an edgy comedian always. He's very edgy. Sometimes he's smart. Sometimes he isn't. You know, he's 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 been very volatile in his life, you know, kind yes. of disappearing for periods and that whole thing with his show where he kind of <laughs> had a nervous breakdown, you know. And um, yeah. I... I, I he, I mean, he, his, he says for him it's an art form, and he says, let me do my art. This is my art, you know? I think if you compare Chappelle with someone like Richard Pryor. Yes. Watch some old Richard Pryor stand-up routines. Somehow Richard Pryor knows how to kind of get at the same edgy, edgy humor without, without the, the humiliation. Yes. Yeah. Without the kind of piling on. Like one thing that made Richard Pryor so such a profound comedian was he he could make jokes about gay people, but they would bounce back to him at some point. You know? Yes. He he had a way of doing it that didn't have the sting of homophobia, but felt kind of more inclusive in a way, you know? Yes. And, and it's a subtle thing. It's a subtle thing that I think you have to be a master of comedy to handle. I guess my yeah. point is this. I, I think that Making fun of trans people, it's a cheap punchline. Yeah. And it sounds to me yeah. like Chappelle went for some cheap punchlines. And that's the term here. they use. They say punching down on us, and, and that's they do feel abused. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and what was interesting in the Chappelle show at the end, he talks about um, a transgender friend of his who became a friend. She attended one of the shows, and her name was Daphne. Daphne. And um, and she he, he let her go up on stage, and she opened for him one night. And she was there to see him use these these terrible terms punched down on the transgender community and she was there laughing with it and he said mm -hmm. you know she understood it was comedy and she was there laughing but then you know not too long after she ended up taking her life mm. so i you know that's i think there's something to be mm. said about that she may have been laughing 
but she was really in severe agony. And so I think there's something yeah. to be said about that. I wasn't aware of that. Yes. Has Chappelle uh, acknowledged the death of anyone? Not way, that I'm aware, aware, of, aware of, I'm sorry. But at the, end of the, at, at the end of his show, he says, you know, he says, and it seems heartfelt that, you know, she was a friend of mine. But then he says, but she jumped off a building and only a man would have done that, you know? So mm. he he'll, he yeah. comes to some humility and then he goes for the punchline yeah. again. And so I think yeah. that's where the, where the problem is yeah. that a lot of the transgender community yeah. is having. And, you know, he is a funny person and I think he's smart in ways. But I, hearing the story about how Daphne took her life after that, you yeah. know, she may not have really been laughing. Right, right, exactly. Or you're in a context, you're yes. in a situation, and, yes. and you go along because you know, you know, you're you're caught up in that that moment or situation. Um, yeah, you know, let me say this. I, I've been curious. You know, I've I've read a lot about Chappelle's routine yes. and all of this, and I've. I've heard about it, but and I've been curious about it, but I have made a deliberate point not to watch it as out of respect for the trans voices yes. that have called it out for, I'm trusting their perspective Absolutely. over others. And my fear, honestly, is if I watch it just to satisfy my curiosity, I mean, that'll be like a click or a, a, a rating hit. For, that'll tell Netflix that it's popular and they'll order more. I, I know, and I'm a comedian of sorts, <laughs> if, I'm, if I do say so myself, but I think there has to be a line drawn, and when we're seeing, when they when he jokes about white people, I can sit there and laugh and say, because I'm not, I'm not threatened, I, there's no immediate mm -hmm. threat to me, I can laugh it off, mm -hmm. but in the transgender community, I, I get where people are coming from saying, look, he's a comedian, this is what he does, yeah, yeah. if you don't like it, don't watch, but when transgender people's life expectancy is 35, mm -hmm. according to Ashley Marie Preston, who is an activist in mm -hmm. the community, yeah. that's, that's a scary thing and it's still a real, a real threat. And I, yeah. I think we have to be careful Absolutely. when it comes to that. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. These are, you know, this is, um, been, these have been the arguments of GLAAD, you know, yes. Gay Lesbian uh, Alliance Against Defamation for a very long time, you know. And, and I mean, your point is absolutely right. And um, there's a direct relationship between uh, suicide, uh, not just suicides, but also targeting, you know, violence. Yes, it's yes, like it emboldens yes. people to pick on people like yeah. that, you mm -hmm. know, either at the school level or walking down the street. You know, it, embol it emboldens someone who's maybe, you know, they can't get a job and they feel like it's someone else's fault, you know, and they're frustrated in their life and they're going to, oh, that, it's that person's <laughs> fault. And, and they're weak and, and it's okay to pick on that person and I'm just going to let them have it even though I've never met yeah. that person walking down the street out of the blue, you know. Um, but where does that come from? Is that, is it is ignorance? I would definitely say it was ignorance, but is it fear? Are people really afraid to let people be who they want to be and who they are, really? I think a lot of um, homophobia comes, I think a lot of the violent, I, I can't say this exactly with trans people, but I, I, I know that with gay people, a lot of the people who tend to go out of the way to beat them up and, and, and persecute and attack them are often people with their own unresolved sexualities. I believe so too. And yeah. I think that maybe with trans people, it just, all that gets mixed up in it somehow. You know, yes. there's, there's something about them. Often maybe a masculine crisis, you know? Yeah. I, I think we're in the, the midst of a big masculine crisis <laughs> right now. You know, the pandemic has, yes. has, has sort of triggered all these anxieties of, among many men about their power and authority. And, and I think that's what a lot of the anti-vaxxing stuff is kind of rooted in is a kind of gender anxiety. And, and a lot of that presumes a very traditional gendered worldview where, you know, husband, you know, nuclear yeah, family, nuclear. husband, male, all of that. And, and to just see a trans person visibly walking down the street to them is a, is a political statement against their rights, mm. you know? That's interesting, And yeah. so somehow it inflames something. And I think people do it because people get away with doing it. Mm -hmm. And people have gotten away with doing it. And, and you know, um, you know uh, no offense to anyone in law enforcement, but for many years it was law enforcement doing it. Yes, that's Just true. as bad as that's anyone true. else. Going out of their way to humiliate trans people in particular and to criminalize them and to give them the worst possible experience whenever there's any kind of encounter. And when you see public servants doing that, it, what does mm -hmm. that tell young children? Well, and the police. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, not just public servants, but, but people who are armed. The and, ha and have the the, mm -hmm. the force behind them, you know, that they're the ones doing that. Now, now, I, I, police agencies have undergone sensitivity training. <laughs> a lot of them are better, you know. I, I know that there's a lot of police out there who are now educated and 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 go about this in a much better way. I know there's a lot who don't. In the past, it was pretty much a hundred percent across yeah, the board, yeah. and so those those traumas don't go away. Well, Professor, it's been so refreshing having you. I could talk to you for hours, and I'm, I, I still have some classes left with you this semester, so I'm excited for them. But thank you so much for taking time out of your day and your schedule and teaching us and just you offering your wisdom because it's so invaluable, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have you here with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us today in In Focus, and another big thank you to Professor Lofton for sharing his wisdom and expertise with all of us. We surely still have so much to learn. I'm Chris Adler. Stay safe, Titans.